Over the past three weeks, we have delved into the topic of healing, focusing on what takes place on earth as it is in the kingdom of God in heaven. Today, we aim to share the concluding insights with you. Thus, the theme for today is word, speaking according to the word faith, and in parentheses, experiencing miracles. In our initial sessions, we discussed the significance of the word and faith, initially thinking that these aspects were sufficient. However, we came to understand that a missing link was speaking according to the word. We emphasize that without speaking in alignment with the word, faith is absent, and without faith, the transformative power of the Lord's word remains unexperienced in our lives. Today marks the conclusion, word speaking according to the word, faith, action, result in experiencing miracles. Yes, during this session, fill in the parentheses, and may your lives be ushered into a transformative change. Once again, it is crucial to recognize that as children of God, we must live a life that speaks in accordance with God's word. Even when faced with seemingly impossible situations, such as commanding a mountain to be thrown into the sea, we should not say, I can't utter such things because I lack faith. I am a rational and reasonable person. Uttering such statements plays into the enemy's schemes and deception. It is precisely because we do not speak that new faith, the faith given by God, fails to take root within us. Therefore, when we speak, faith is engendered within us. As reiterated last week, when we speak in accordance with the word, the authority of the enemy is severed. From that point onward, the Holy Spirit works through our words, creating an image that becomes a reality in the unseen world. When we speak, the gateway between the invisible and visible worlds opens. Just as God spoke when creating seemingly impossible things, and Jesus spoke in accordance with God's word while fulfilling God's will on earth, if we are children of God in Jesus Christ, we must likewise speak in alignment with the word of the Lord to fulfill his will. What is of utmost importance is the awareness that when you proclaim with your lips, speaking in accordance with the word in Christ, it becomes spirit, life, and power. Jesus said, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Today we acknowledge that we have died and it is Christ who lives within us. In this moment we speak Christ's words, living a life that manifests Christ. Therefore, I affirm that what I say becomes spirit and life. When you speak in alignment with this truth, it is not merely the breaking of the devil's authority, but a resonance from head to heart, empowering you and filling you with strength, all because the Holy Spirit is with you. Many times we have spoken words that echo emptiness, where our words did not align with our hearts. But today, as children of God, we must learn to speak in accordance with the Lord's word in Jesus Christ. I wish for you to realize that the words coming from your lips are indeed spirit and life. Believe and accept it in faith. From that moment, the Holy Spirit will work and fervor will ignite within you. Today marks the final step to experience miracles. What is this last step? We thought it was about words speaking according to the word and faith. However, depending on the nature of our faith, we may or may not experience miracles. The faith the Lord speaks of is not merely accepting his words wholeheartedly, but allowing the faith within Christ, not my faith, but the faith within Christ, to be the driving force. This faith is active faith. Therefore, the answer to today's title is word, speaking according to the word faith and action miracle experience. Today we seek to understand the faith that takes action. 
To possess active faith, we must understand the relationship between righteousness and faith. An astonishing fact is found in Romans 1.17. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. The gospel reveals the righteousness of God. And the remarkable fact is that the righteous shall live by faith. This gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ conveyed to us, signifies that the righteousness of God is revealed to us. The term righteousness signifies God's character, essence, and nature. So how does God's righteousness manifest in us? It occurs through our having a proper relationship with God in Christ, leading to God's governance over us, resulting in the manifestation of righteousness. Therefore, seek first his kingdom and righteousness. What is the kingdom? It is none other than God's rule. Through God's governance, we become righteous. And furthermore, we progress to become those who fulfill righteousness. Experiencing God's righteousness revealed in the gospel implies the restoration of our relationship with God through Jesus Christ's substitution for our sin. Consequently, we are reconciled to God according to his original intention, and thereafter, we are called to live in alignment with the purpose for which God created us. In the gospel, the manifestation of God's righteousness and our experience of that righteousness is a result of the atonement through Jesus Christ where God redeems us. As a consequence, we return to being God's children. And having become God's children, we live a life aligned with his original purpose. Experiencing God's righteousness is exactly as stated in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. It means we have become entirely new beings with a new essence and nature. This narrative pertains not to our physical bodies, but to our spiritual selves. Therefore, despite no apparent change in our physical bodies, we have effectively become different beings. We have become a new creation in Christ. To phrase it differently, as stated in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Through the gospel, God's righteousness is revealed. Through the Old Testament priesthood and the role of the priests, we can understand how we receive forgiveness of sin. According to the established Old Testament priesthood, the high priest would sacrifice an offering, sprinkling its blood in the holy of holies on the mercy seat within the Ark of the Covenant, satisfying God's righteousness. As a result, not only the high priest, but also the people received physical purification. However, the nature of sin, the essence of sin, did not disappear. The consciousness of sin persisted due to the sin nature. Additionally, the Old Testament sacrifices could only cover sin for a certain period, not permanently eliminate it. Hence, they had to perform sacrifices annually. Hebrews 10, 1, 4 states, 1, 4, since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities. It can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, Make perfect those who draw near. Too otherwise would they not have ceased to be offered. Since the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins, three, but in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. Four, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Although the annual sacrifices covered their sins, it did not eradicate the consciousness of sin. 
Therefore, sacrifices had to be made each year. However, what did the Holy God, Jesus Christ, do when he came to this earth? He offered himself not in the earthly tabernacle, a mere model and shadow of the heavenly kingdom, but went into the heavenly sanctuary. Jesus Christ personally bore the sins of all humanity on the cross, replacing us and God's Spirit raised the dead Jesus Christ. Subsequently, Jesus took his blood into the heavenly sanctuary. Hebrews 8, 1, 2 affirms. 1, now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, to a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man, he did not offer sacrifices in the earthly tabernacle, the model of the holy and priestly system, but in the heavenly sanctuary. Therefore, Hebrews 9, 11, 14 states, 11, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. Well, he entered once for all, into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing eternal redemption. 13, for if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, 14, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God Purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Christ's blood through the eternal spirit purifies our conscience from dead works, enabling us to serve the living God. Jesus came into the world as the lamb that bears the sin of the world. Though he came as the lamb carrying the sins of the world, he bore the burden of those sins, died, and shed his blood. After his resurrection, he functioned not as the lamb bearing the sins of the world, but as the high priest. He entered the heavenly holy of holies, sprinkling his blood before the Father. As a result, he satisfied God's righteousness. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins, and the wages of sin is death. Jesus fulfilled God's righteousness by sprinkling his blood satisfying God's law. When Jesus came to this earth, he bore the sins of the world as the lamb. But when he carried the cross, rose and ascended, he functioned as the high priest. When we unite with Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection, Jesus Christ becomes God's righteousness within us. This is precisely what 2 Corinthians 5, 20, one conveys. Therefore, from the beginning of faith to its conclusion, it is all about being in Jesus Christ, in Christ, within me, Christ in me, that is everything. Why did the Apostle Paul mention that the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel? It is because this righteousness is revealed. In this gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Consequently, we no longer have a consciousness of sin, but a consciousness of righteousness. After the fall, the fundamental consciousness shared by all humanity is typically one of sin and fear. This is because, due to human sin, the Spirit of God departed and humanity became self-existent, separated from God. The root consciousness at the bottom of fallen human nature is the consciousness of sin and fear. Think about it. The reason why humans tend to have more negative thoughts than positive ones, more disbelief than faith, and dwell in lack and deficiency rather than feeling full, is because as a result of the original sin, our inner selves were awakened. We were separated from God and the consciousness we have as independent beings is inherently negative, desperate, unbelieving, lacking, and futile. It is the consciousness of being separated from God, 
In other words, it is the consciousness of sin. The consciousness of sin, in a word, is the consciousness of sin produced as a byproduct of spiritual death due to the original sin. We must realize that the root of all human problems is the consciousness of sin. Even though it is said that God loves us, and even though God has spoken, why is it so difficult to believe? Doubts always arise, and it's all because of the consciousness of sin. In other words, the ultimate desire of humanity is to be free from this consciousness of sin. The starting point of all religions lies in this consciousness of sin. Some even say that the consciousness of sin is the mother of all religions. Yes, why were all religions created? It is precisely to remove the deep-seated consciousness of sin within us. Everyone desires true freedom and peace without the consciousness of sin. But the reality is that only when we return to the Creator God can we experience such peace and freedom. The kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking, but about righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Consider this carefully. When you talk about how insignificant, worthless, pitiful and evil you are, those words seem convincing. However, even if you talk about how valuable, beautiful, noble and capable you are, it is challenging to believe. Why is that? It's because we are still captivated by the consciousness of sin. The most fundamental consciousness that a separated being has is the consciousness of sin. But we have already become a new creation, and we do not fully realize that we are no longer bound by the corrupted heart. We believe in Jesus, receive forgiveness of sins and salvation but we do not properly understand who we are because the knowledge of who I am can be known and experienced through the Holy Spirit. When we believe in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes into us, but to truly experience being God's children, we need to experience the Holy Spirit. Only then will we begin to realize that our Master is no longer ourselves, but the Holy Spirit governing our soul and body. Even though God has called us his children, we confess that we are God's children, yet we still cannot overcome human limitations. The reality is that while proclaiming, I am a child of God within Christ, we still cannot overcome human limitations. Why is that? It's because of the consciousness of sin that is still within us. The essence of the gospel is that the righteousness of God is revealed, and through this we gain a consciousness of righteousness. Moreover, the sad reality is that even diligent believers may fear becoming prideful before God. Consequently, they live a life constantly reminding themselves of how much of a sinner they are, thinking, I am a sinner like myself, a wretched sinner, a sinful creature deserving death. Yes, we mistakenly consider the consciousness of sin as a means to prevent our pride. We are rejecting God's invitation to truly become his children due to our flawed consciousness. It is a pitiful situation. Only when the consciousness of sin disappears from our souls and the consciousness of God's righteousness enters. In other words, when we experience Christ's consciousness, the consciousness of righteousness, the consciousness representing God, only then can we truly humble ourselves, go beyond disguised pride, become truly one with God, and be transformed into those who fulfill God's righteousness. Consider how we have lived our faith until now. We have emphasized and heard only the story that we are sinners destined to die. Due to the emphasis on sin, we have placed ourselves in the consciousness of sin. 
However, we should focus solely on the fact that we have received forgiveness of sins through faith in Jesus Christ. Sadly, we have not properly heard or experienced what happens within us after receiving forgiveness of sins, how the consciousness of sin disappears and the consciousness of God's righteousness as his children comes in. We claim that we have received forgiveness of sins through faith in Jesus Christ. However, the consciousness of sin still fills our hearts. Even if we talk about the promises of the word, we cannot believe them. Why? Because the consciousness of sin is still within us. Unlike other religions, Christianity does not resolve the consciousness of sin on its own. It is because God, the Holy One, personally came to this earth, bore our sins, and made us new through water and the Spirit. We became righteous through Jesus Christ, and that is why we strive to live a life representing God. That is Christianity. However, we have not experienced the state of our souls being freed from servitude to the body by the Spirit of God, residing in the Spirit of God. Therefore, we earnestly practice our faith based on the conceptual belief that we have become children of God through faith in Jesus Christ without ever experiencing living a life representing God's righteousness and fulfilling His will. However, the scriptures clearly speak not only of the imputation of sin, but also of the imputation of righteousness. In Romans 5, 18, 19, it is written, 18, therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. 19.4 as by the one man's disobedience. The many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience. Righteous. In Romans 3, 22, it states, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. And in verse 26, it says, it was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justier of the one who has faith in Jesus. To reiterate, as mentioned earlier in 2 Corinthians 5, 21 for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We are the righteousness of God. Yes, the righteousness of God. Through Jesus Christ, we have been reconciled with God, and we, through the union of God's spirit with our spirit, have undergone a transformation in our essence. We are not just those who believe themselves to be children of God, but are indeed children of God. Therefore, we must live a life representing the righteousness of God. We have no consciousness of sin within us. We are beings incapable of sinning. Though our flesh may commit sin, in reality our essence is incapable of sinning. Within us exists not the consciousness of sin, but only the consciousness of righteousness, the consciousness of Christ, the consciousness representing God. However, due to not truly knowing who we are, we still live in the false identity of receiving forgiveness of sins and salvation while dwelling in the consciousness of sin. I reiterate that to eliminate this consciousness of sin. We need to experience the Holy Spirit. Only when the Holy Spirit captivates us can we truly experience who we are. No longer the false self, but the being within Christ, having the consciousness representing God. Now that we understand that the gospel reveals the righteousness of God, it is essential to explore how this righteousness leads to faith through faith. The gospel declares that the righteousness of God is revealed and leads to faith through faith. This statement speaks of leading to a new faith through the righteousness of God. Consider this. The gospel declares that the righteousness of God is revealed, leading to faith upon faith. However, 
without understanding what this new faith is, many still interpret it as the first faith. That is the belief in the false self, where we as sinners are considered righteous through faith in Jesus Christ. We continue our life of faith thinking that we have been justified through faith in Jesus Christ despite being sinners. However, being justified and becoming righteous are vastly different. Being justified is still under the realm of the false self, under the belief of the false self. However, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, making us the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. In other words, it is the conceptual acceptance of being called righteous and justified through faith. It is unknowingly accepting this calling, this righteousness and justification with our own mental understanding. Yet, some might think that this transformation into God's righteousness will only happen after death when we enter heaven. No, the Bible does not say that. The gospel declares that the righteousness of God is revealed and leads to faith through faith. We have believed in Jesus Christ through faith for salvation. Therefore, we consider ourselves sinners who have received justification through faith. We believe in being justified through faith. The reason we can fall into this misconception is that, in reality, we continue to commit sins. Thus, while believing in Jesus Christ and striving in our faith, the consciousness of sin and fear always shadows us. Consequently, our thoughts are dominated by how we can avoid sinning, how we can live a holy life, becoming the essence of our entire faith. Regardless of what we do or think, the shadow of consciousness of sin and fear always follows us. Therefore, even though we sincerely strive in our faith, the consciousness of sin and fear is ever present. So when reading the Bible, the kingdom of God, characterized by righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, remains a hope rather than a reality. Why does this happen? It is because we fail to distinguish between the Old Testament and the New Testament. In other words, we do not truly understand who we are. We must recognize that Within Jesus Christ, we are not forgiven sinners, but righteous individuals capable of sinning. If my nature is that of the false self, then I am a forgiven sinner. Why? Because I am still committing sin. However, if, due to the indwelling of God's Spirit, I have become a new creation, a spiritual being in Jesus Christ, and this is now my essence, then I am not a forgiven sinner, but a righteous person capable of sinning, despite my flesh still sinning. In 1 John 3, 1, it is stated, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. Being children of God means we cannot be sinners. Claiming to be both a child of God and a sinner is equivalent to insulting God and blatantly ignoring God's power. If one prays to our Heavenly Father and at the same time declares themselves a sinner, it is a truly absurd and blasphemous act. How can a child of God be a sinner? The reason Jesus came to this earth, endured the cross for us, and sent the promised Holy Spirit was to transform us into righteous individuals representing God. However, if Christ resides within me, how can I consider myself a sinner? We are capable of sinning but are righteous individuals. The gospel declares that the righteousness of God is revealed and leads to faith through faith. Reiterating the reason we find ourselves living in this manner is that Despite reaching faith through faith, we fail to move beyond it and continue our life of faith, still believing in the false self. To truly understand this issue, we need to examine Abraham in the Old Testament. In Genesis 12, 
God chose Jacob to save all fallen humanity. Jacob is Israel, and Abraham is the father of Israel. God called Abraham, directing him to leave his homeland and relatives to go to the land of Canaan. And God considered Abraham's faith as righteousness. So, in Genesis 15, 6, it says, And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. And Romans 4. Three states for what does the scripture say. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Think about it, God called Abraham. But in reality, Abraham's life was not one of righteousness. In Genesis 12, God promised to make Abraham a great nation. Yet in Genesis 15, Abraham said that his heir would be Eliezer of Damascus, since God had not given him offspring. At that time, God was not silent. He spoke, saying that the son born to your body would be the heir. And Abraham believed again, receiving righteousness through faith because of his belief. However, as time passed without news, even with prolonged waiting, Sarah's suggestion in Genesis 16 led to the birth of Ishmael through her maidservant Hagar when Abraham was 86 years old. After the events in Genesis 16, in chapter 17, God appeared again to Abraham at the age of 99. Despite frequently meeting in such ways, there was a prolonged silence after the birth of Ishmael. Considering the current conflicts in the Middle East between the descendants of Isaac and Ishmael, we see the consequences of Abraham's actions. The reason for the ongoing strife is rooted in the children of Abraham. Therefore, it must have been heartbreaking for God. Nonetheless, in Genesis 17, God appeared again, stating that he would fulfill the original covenant with Abraham. Moreover, God changed Abraham's name to Abraham and Sarah's name to Sarah. God promised that Abraham, at the age of 100, would have a son, Isaac, born next year. God mentioned that he would grant Abraham a son named Isaac. As a sign of this covenant, God commanded circumcision. Through this, we can understand that God regarded Abraham's faith in Genesis 15 as righteousness. Even though Abraham was not always righteous and faithful, however, God, who is always faithful, matured Abraham step by step through his journey of faith. In Genesis 21, God finally fulfilled his promise, and Abraham, at the age of 100, became the father of Isaac. The New Testament apostle, Paul, addresses this in Romans 4, 18.22, saying, 18 in hope, he believed against hope, that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told. So shall your offspring be. Nineteen, he did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body. Since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, twenty, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. Twenty, one fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Twenty counted is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. It's not about becoming righteous. It's about being counted as righteous. Yes, through the continuous maturation of faith, God reiterated the promise once again in chapter 17 and finally in chapter 21. Sarah gave birth to Isaac. At that time, there were indeed many failures. Abraham did not obey God's word. However, in the end, he truly believed in God, and as a result, Isaac was born one year later. The issue here is that being counted as righteous through Abraham's faith is not the entire story. 
What we want to discuss today is that in God's gospel, being counted as righteous through faith corresponds to the first faith. It corresponds to the first faith. Perhaps one of the most challenging stories in Genesis is found in chapter 22. God commanded Abraham to do something utterly incomprehensible and difficult to accept. In Genesis 22, 1-2, it says, One after these things God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am, to he said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. This is a completely shocking narrative. How can God, after making promises over many years, remembering Abraham's faith and finally counting it as righteousness, suddenly give such a command? After giving Isaac according to his promise, he now says to sacrifice Isaac as a burnt offering. This is a story that is humanly impossible to comprehend. However, the remarkable fact is that Abraham's faith changed after he had Isaac. After receiving Isaac, he dared to question God, saying, If you take away the son you gave me, what will happen to your promise? He didn't utter a single word when God told him to sacrifice Isaac. Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men, his son Isaac, cut the wood for the burnt offering, and set out for the place God had told him. Just obeyed. In Genesis 22, 5, it says, Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Consider this faith. Yes, his faith changed. If two people go and both are supposed to return, here he says, we will come again to you. How amazing is this faith? Taking another step, the son asked. In Genesis 22, 7, 8, the son's inquiry is quite remarkable. So when the son asked, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham replied, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. Abraham said something unbelievable, considering he was about to sacrifice his own son. Tears would naturally flow, and it seems like tears of blood would fall when thinking about sacrificing his own son. Yet, he boldly stated, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. He didn't say this is a bluff. Why? Because when he went up to the designated place that God had appointed, he bound his son there, placed wood on the altar, and intended to sacrifice his son with a knife. He didn't just say it. He actually tried to sacrifice his son. However, at that very moment, when he lifted the knife to slaughter his son, in Genesis 22, 12, 13, an angel, a messenger from heaven, appeared. It says, 12, he said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. 13, and Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram, caught in a thicket by his horn. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. It's an astonishing faith. His faith before obtaining Isaac and his faith after obtaining Isaac were completely different. Consider the remarkable transformation of faith. Until he obtained Isaac, he believed in the promise God gave him. However, after receiving Isaac, God spoke as if breaking the promise. Surprisingly, he no longer judged God's words based on his own standards of good and evil. Instead, he feared and trusted the faithful Lord God. This is a faith that one who doesn't abandon oneself cannot possess. It's something that seems impossible and unacceptable according to one's own thoughts. 
However, he accepted God, not based on his own faith in the promise, but by surrendering himself. It's a faith given when one abandons oneself. Yes, initially he believed in God with his own faith. Nevertheless, God counted him as righteous. But now, Abraham's actions are not based on his previous faith. It's a new faith. It's not a faith that a person with a false sense of self can have. He truly believed that the Lord God does not break his promises. He surrendered his self and offered himself to the Lord God. Why am I saying all this? In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed through faith, for faith. And only the righteous will live by faith. The righteousness of God, God's righteousness, is not merely receiving justification, but is the manifestation of God's righteousness. However, how does it apply to us? It means changing from the faith of human false pretenses to the faith of surrendering oneself with Christ consciousness. That is what it means for the righteousness of God to be in Jesus Christ. What we need is precisely that kind of faith. However, we often do not understand what the righteousness of God truly is. We still rely on our false self-centered faith, thinking because God forgave my sins and made me his child, I'm trying to live a holy life. Yet, even within that, there is a lack of consciousness of righteousness and we are filled with a sense of sin. This is because we haven't acquired the second faith. We do not know what the second faith is. From the perspective of the new covenant, what does it say about being justified? The apostle Paul talked about being justified in Romans 4, but from the standpoint of being made righteous, Hebrews 11, 1719 speaks, 17 be faith Abraham when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, 18 of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. 19 he considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Yes, Abraham had faith not in his own belief in God's promises, but in surrendering himself, having faith in God. His faith was not the faith that justifies based on the past promises, but the faith that acts when one surrenders oneself. Through the event of Abraham sacrificing Isaac, he didn't know it himself, but he saw the Messiah who would come. Yes, it's the faith of a new dimension that progresses from faith to faith. This is a prophetic example of the faith of the one who became the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ in the new covenant. In this time, we become the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. This faith, the faith of the one who became righteousness, is the same faith that Abraham had when he offered Isaac as a sacrifice. This is a faith that acts according to the Lord's word because the false self has died. It is not a faith that merely receives justification, but a faith in God's righteousness because it has become righteousness. To put it simply, when Abraham demonstrated faith by offering Isaac on the altar, it revealed a faith not aimed at obtaining salvation, but a faith of the righteous, as he had become righteous in Christ. Once again, it is the faith that takes action. James clearly addresses this aspect in James 2, 21, 24. 21, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? 22, you see that faith was active along with his works. 23 was completed by his works. 20, Three in the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness and he was called a friend of God. 
24. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Understanding this truth is crucial to avoid significant conflicts and confusion. Looking at Abraham's example, the first faith was for justification, but the second faith, after becoming righteous in the Lord, is for fulfilling the Lord's will. In the gospel, God's righteousness is revealed, leading to faith and righteousness. The first faith is for us, as false selves, to become children of God and obtain salvation. However, once we have obtained salvation and become God's righteousness, we must now live by a faith that takes action, not just faith alone. If we do not realize the difference between the faith in becoming righteous through believing in Jesus Christ in Romans and the faith in becoming righteous in the Lord in James, confusion arises. Romans speaks of faith that justifies sinners, which is based on the faith of the false self. On the other hand, James discusses a different faith, a faith within Christ that has become God's righteousness. For the righteous to fulfill God's will, Romans emphasizes that to become righteous, it is solely through faith. In contrast, James focuses on the faith that makes one righteous, the faith of a righteous person within the kingdom of God in Jesus Christ. This faith within Christ should manifest as active faith, not mere false self-centered belief. Therefore, during the time of the Reformation when there was no revelation about the kingdom of God, Martin Luther expressed a desire to exclude the book of James, calling it an epistle of straw. He believed salvation came only through faith. It was a counteraction against the Catholic doctrine that salvation required works. However, understanding the kingdom life within God and Jesus Christ was still lacking. In the present perspective of the kingdom of God, Romans and James do not conflict. Instead, they perfectly align. To become righteous, one initially relies on the false self's faith. However, once God dwells within us, making us his righteousness, we are called to live not just by faith, but by active faith, aligning with God's word on this earth. Salvation is attained through faith when we are false selves. But when we become God's righteousness in him, we need a faith that acts to fulfill God's word. Therefore, when salvation is sought, faith alone suffices. But when facing judgment at Jesus' return, it requires faith accompanied by actions. Within the kingdom of God, living a life that represents the Lord is essential. This means that those in Christ should now manifest righteousness through their actions. Understanding this truth is crucial. When we speak according to God's word in the unseen world, the manifestation of that reality requires faith in action. As the Apostle Paul stated, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Romans 1, 17. The righteous who has already become righteous lives by faith in action. It is not their faith, but the faith of Christ, the faith that acts. This is the faith of the righteous living not in sin, consciousness, but in righteousness, consciousness. A person with a consciousness of sin can only live by their faith, their own self-centered belief. However, when one becomes aware of being a child of God through the Spirit of God and develops a consciousness of righteousness, they live by a second faith, faith within faith. This is the faith that actively fulfills God's will on earth. In Hebrews 11.6 it says, And without faith it is impossible to please him, 
For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. It is about believing in the one who seeks God, not just the one who believes in the promise. Therefore, believing in God's promises, it is not merely about this faith, but directly trusting God, surrendering oneself to become one with him. This faith involves surrendering oneself. The second faith, in essence, is the faith of surrendering oneself. It is through this surrender that one becomes united with him, living a life that manifests him on earth. However, from a human existential perspective, when we say something, our words do not merely function in our bodies. Rather, when our souls reside within the Spirit of God, the faith given at that time is this second faith. It is then that we speak as God speaks, bringing to pass what we speak in the unseen world, feeling it and attaching reality to it. Hebrews describes this faith in Hebrews 10, 38, 39, stating, 38, but my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. 39, but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Yes, those who preserve their souls have faith in salvation. This means that the soul, having free will, can function in the body or enter into the Spirit of God. Thus, faith in the salvation of the soul is precisely faith in Jesus Christ. The righteous live solely by faith. Therefore, the Lord says, when the Son of Man comes, Will he find faith on earth? He is coming again. At that time, those whom the Lord permits bodily resurrection, his children, are those who possess this faith. This faith actively fulfills God's will on earth. When the Lord comes again, he will look for this faith on earth. We must live according to this faith in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed, leading from faith to faith. Let us not live by mere belief, but live by mere belief, but live by faith. It is not about believing in my own authority and trusting in God's word. It is about having faith in becoming one with God through death, having a consciousness of righteousness and fulfilling God's will, of faith in Christ, this faith creates the reality that has been accomplished in the unseen world according to God's word. Regardless of what is visible, it is not bound by it, but speaking according to God's word in Christ, it is faith that creates the reality accomplished by God in the unseen world. This faith is the faith in Jesus Christ. However, astonishingly, even when Jesus conducted his ministry of coexistence, those who met Jesus during his earthly life, despite living as Old Testament people with a false self without the Spirit, often surrendered their personal faith and attached themselves to the faith in Christ. When Jesus personally appeared and spoke, that was experiencing miracle. Do you see this picture? What is it? It is an illustration of Peter walking on the water from Matthew 14. When Jesus walked on the sea at night, the disciples, thinking it was a ghost, were frightened. Jesus said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Then Peter said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, Come. However, Peter did not say, Thank you, Lord. I can also walk if you are with me. No, he did not. He demonstrated a faith of action. It's either sinking or walking. It's one or the other. He exhibited a faith of surrender, a faith that's solely focused on the Lord. Do you know when miracles happen? It happens from faith to faith. Do you know what kind of faith God's children should have? Do you know what active faith is? However, we are not doing that. 
we still consider the Lord as our creator with an amazing power. Surely the Lord will work. Tonight he will heal you. You say this and that, but it's just talk. There's no action. There's no action. However, look at Peter. If Peter had his false self, he would have said, Lord, I believe I can walk too if you are with me. Did he say that? No, he did not. Jesus said, come. So it's either sinking or walking. However, at the moment of taking a step, a miracle happened. So as Peter was walking, the wind blew and he began to sink when he got caught up in the environment without looking at Jesus. At that moment, Jesus said, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? He reached out his hand and caught Peter and brought him back into the boat. Peter demonstrated a faith in action. How about the woman with the issue of blood? For 12 years, she suffered from this condition, went to every hospital, spent all her money and was completely devastated. In that state, she heard about Jesus and kept saying, if I only touch his garment, I will be made well. She thought she would be healed if she touched Jesus' garment. I mentioned this last week. It says, if I touch his garment, I will be made well. However, the interpretation of this thought. Mira is incorrectly translated. The original Greek translation is lego, which means to say, to speak. In the original meaning and tense in Greek grammar, it means to say continuously, 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 continuously. At first, this woman had no faith. However, there was no other way to go. She had heard of numerous miracles. So how did she think? She thought, if I go forward and try to reach Jesus, I might be hit and killed by a stone even before I get there. So even if I go back, if I touch the edge of his garment, I will be healed. She created an image by saying this and continued to speak it like a child. When she continuously spoke and created that image, the Holy Spirit worked within her, deeply embedded in her heart. So she pushed through crowd. And when Jesus said, who touched my garments? People were bumping into each other saying, who touched me? When she confessed, kneeling down, Jesus said, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Isn't this faith in action? Miracles happen because of her actions. You cannot just say, I believe, I believe. I believe and expect to experience miracles. How about the paralyzed man? Friends brought him, opened the roof and lowered him down to Jesus. Jesus said, rise, pick up your bed and go home. However, the man did not say, Lord, you don't see my condition, right? Why did his friends even bring him here, tied up like this? If he had said that, how could he experience a miracle? Jesus said, take up your bed and walk. When he said that, his words are truth, spirit, and life. Because Jesus came personally and spoke the words, what I say to you is spirit and life. And when he spoke according to those words, the power of the Holy Spirit came upon the man. He responded as he believed. That's when the miracle happened. At the synagogue, there was a man with a withered hand. Jesus was teaching in the synagogue, and he looked around seeing this man with the withered hand. He instructed him, stretch out your hand, but the man couldn't do it as he had never been able to stretch it out before. If he had acted differently, how could he have experienced the miracle? When Jesus told him to stretch out his hand, he did so, and his hand was restored. What about the ten lepers? When Jesus entered a village on his way to Jerusalem, lepers stood at a distance and called out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Jesus said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. As they went, they were cleans. It's a faith in action. When Jesus encountered a blind man from the moment he was on earth, 
He spat on the ground, made mud with the saliva, anointed the man's eyes, and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam. Did the blind man go there and wash as instructed? No. Jesus told him to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. It's a faith in action. It's not based on one's judgment. Even though it seems impossible and beyond one's own ability, it's a faith that surrenders oneself, believes in God's word, and acts accordingly. That's how miracles happen. The Bible is filled with such examples, but we often misunderstand. This kind of faith brings about miracles. It's either sink or swim. However, not wanting to sink is faith in faith. What if you sink? Grace is risky and fearful because it's given when the false self dies. Holding on to oneself and receiving God's grace is like being a thief. God doesn't operate that way. He demands us to throw ourselves into his word. When we call this faith into faith, the first faith is the belief that I believe. The second faith is aligning one's thoughts, emotions, and will with his word. It means sacrificing oneself, giving up on oneself. That's what the word says. In the past, I had many experiences like that. Some people come limping. When asked why they came, they say, I want healing. If I say, one, two, three, jump. Some may start jumping while others struggle. Some might ask, why should I jump? Some end up jumping, but others find it strange and think, am I crazy? It's quite unfortunate. I wish you all the second faith. The second faith is the belief that surrenders oneself and acts according to the word of God. When these two become one, miracles can be experienced. 2,000 years ago, when Jesus came as the Son of Man and spoke before the people, the Holy Spirit worked personally in those moments. However, today, when we act according to his word, the Lord is present with us. In those times, anyone who wanted to experience a miracle had to come before the Lord, regardless of whether it took a month or a year. But now, we are grateful because the Lord is present within anyone who believes. He is working with us. When we act according to his promise and word, we experience miracles. In summary, when we hear the word of the Lord, we must speak as the word says. When we hear the word of the Lord, we must know how to speak as the word says. However, who will tell me what the word of the Lord says? Maybe some have never experienced it because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ most of what we hear in church is about him. Most of what we hear in church is about him, not the words he spoke. So if we haven't heard his words, who should speak? It should be me. I should speak. When we speak, as the word says, just like children, when Jesus came to this earth and the devil opposed him, speaking as the word says, speaking as the word says, God will make us live by the words that come out of his lips. What happens when we speak as the word says? An image is created, it is drawn, felt, and a new belief takes root in our hearts. When faith is born in our hearts, when faith is born in our hearts, when the faith that is fulfilled according to the word is established, doubt disappears. At that time, something happens. The authority of the devil is broken. The Holy Spirit continues to work and our hearts become fervent. At that time, the reality is created in the unseen world. Since there is nothing on this earth, despite the reality being different, when we continue to speak according to the word of the Lord, we are not looking at the visible world, but the invisible one. What we see is not the visible, but the invisible. 
What is visible is temporary, but what is invisible is eternal. What is visible to us is not revealed through what is visible, but through what is invisible. It is what is invisible that is created to manifest what is seen. The reality that is fulfilled according to the word must exist for the substance of the visible world to appear. You must know how to speak. You must know how to speak. You must know how to speak as the word says. Speaking is the only way faith is born. The astonishing fact is that when you speak, the authority of the devil is broken. The authority of the devil is broken. Yet we seem to be living under the rule of the devil. Many are not aware of it. In our rational, logical, and scientific world, it seems irrational to believe in something beyond reason. It's a tale possible in a prisoner of war camp. However, the fact that the Lord has brought us into Jesus Christ means we are set free into the kingdom of God. The laws of the kingdom of God do not apply to this world. They apply only to the children who have entered into the kingdom of God. Speak as the word says. Continuously, I emphasize to you that the most astonishing thing happens when you cut off the authority of the devil and start speaking as the word says. Your inner being begins to burn. Initially, you may think you are crazy not speaking such words. People might wonder what would happen if they heard it. But gradually, like a child, each proclamation makes your heart and inner being fervent. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is at work? Then you start speaking more forcefully, and with each word it begins to manifest and feel. At that moment, the reality of the unseen world is created. It is recorded in our hearts. God does not show favoritism. We reap what we sow. When it is sown in this way, you speak what is filled in your heart. You speak what is filled in your heart. Initially, you heard and spoke, as the word says, creating faith. After faith is created, we speak based on that faith. From that point on, my words to you are spirit and life. A good person speaks good from the good stored up and an evil person speaks evil from the evil stored up. We are filled with what is fulfilled according to the word of the Lord, and we start proclaiming it. At that time, something remarkable happens. What we speak becomes spirit and life, not only within ourselves, but also serving as a channel between the visible and invisible worlds. A pathway opens up. Our inner being and heart have entered into God's rule. Our inner being and our hearts have entered into God's rule. Therefore, our God spirit, our soul, and our inner being and heart are in harmony. This means that the pathway of glory has been opened. And when that happens, we act as we believe. As we believe, People who couldn't walk, countless instances like that. If you say, walk initially, they may struggle, but eventually they start walking. Yes, even someone with Parkinson's can do it. For example, during a gathering in Bison, can someone with Parkinson's walk? Yes, even those who couldn't walk at all during a gathering in Bison, walk. Walk. Walk when there is divine healing. Later, they started running around the gym. Yes, the same happens in Japan. A sister who was completely in a wheelchair with legs hanging started walking. From that point on, she attended Sunday services without a wheelchair. Why? Because she acted as she believed. Lastly, when we say we act as we believe, what is our body? Our body is our thoughts, emotions, and physical form. Speaking of the current state when we act, our soul is in God's spirit, and our inner being has changed accordingly.
Our hearts have changed, and God's rule governs our soul, thoughts, emotions, and inner being. The pathway to God is open. What's left is our body. The body needs to enter into God's rule. However, the body resists. It has limitations and things it cannot do. That's when miracles happen when, through faith, we speak and act according to the word regarding our body. Yes, the same is happening right here with you. Faith in action. Speaking as the word says, faith. However, this faith is the faith that leads to faith. The faith of the righteous. This faith is the faith that surrenders oneself. It's the faith that aligns oneself, emotions, and will with the word, acknowledging that the word is God. When you have that faith, you start acting. That's when you experience miracles. Let's rise together and pray at this time. Also, in this moment, I hope each one of you can experience a miracle today. For those who came with illness today, we may not know what kind of illness it is, but the Lord has spoken in this time, saying, by his wounds you have been healed. If falsehood is attaching itself to my problems, I must resolve it. But as a child of God in Christ, I am one who fulfills the will of God. In this time, the Lord has spoken that you have been healed by his wounds. We have a new faith. Regardless of the current state of my thoughts or intentions, the word of the Lord is the truth. So you proclaim it with your lips first. You create the reality in the unseen world. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, speak what the word says about your condition. Speak not about the current problems, but about how it has become whole and clean. Just as the word says, keep speaking as the word says, and when faith arises in your heart, you act according to that faith. Some people may have external problems preventing them from walking due to physical issues. Try walking. For those who cannot act due to inner problems, show the faith in action. It's like coming before the Lord. Even if there are issues in the mind, kidneys or elsewhere, and no immediate solution can be found, acting means coming forward before the Lord, saying, Lord, I believe I am healed. I believe I am healed. Not just believing, but coming forward in that place. That is the action of faith before the Lord. Then rejoice and be thankful. That's when you will experience the miracle. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, come. Lord, at this moment, come upon your living children. Seize them from head to toe, Lord, and Father God, may your spirit not serve as a slave to the body, but dwell within, ruling over our soul, thoughts, emotions, and inner being. Let every consciousness of sin disappear, and in this time, may they live in the Spirit of God, fulfilling your will. Lord, you bore all our sins by being whipped by the Father's scourge. You took away all our weaknesses and diseases. You bore my punishment by being whipped. Lord, in this time, let them create reality in the unseen world by speaking as your word says. Lord, open a passage in both the visible and invisible worlds. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, become more powerful. Visit each person, even more powerful, visit each person. Visit. Visit through your spirit, Lord. Make them captives of God's spirit. Father God, lead them to faith through faith. Make them live by faith alone as righteous ones. Oh, Lord, thank you. In this time, Lord, sing and let everyone speak according to your word. 주님, 감사합니다. 아버지 하나님, 뜻이 하늘의 수준같이 땅에서 이루어지는 이 모든 일들에 주님께서 복음을 전하시면서 아버지 하나님, 귀신을 쫓고 질병을 치유하며 하나님 나를 말이 있지 않고 능력에 있음을 우리에게 보여주셨습니다. 하나님, 사주에 걸쳐서 그 말씀의 비밀이 말씀과 말씀대로 말하는 것과 
주님 그리스도 안에 있는 믿음과 행동하는 믿음임을 이제야 깨닫게 되었고 이제야 주님 하나님의 자녀로서 어떻게 주의 뜻을 이루는지 알게 되었습니다 매일매일 주여 말씀대로 선포하고 주님 내 심중에 주의 말씀대로 이루어진 것을 심게 하시고 그 믿는 대로 행동하는 우리가 되게 하여 주옵소서 날마다 주의 은혜와 기적을 경험하는 우리 모두가 되었음을 감사합니다 홀로 영광 받아 주옵소서 감사드렸고 예수님의 이름으로 기도합니다 아멘 아멘 할렐루야 하나님 감사합니다 네 다음 주에 다시 뵙도록 하겠습니다